presence of my enemy. Come on, sing it out. I raise a hallelujah. Louder than the unbelief. Louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. Come on, church, let's sing this together. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. Louder and louder. You're gonna hear my praises roll. Up from the ashes, hope will rise. Death is defeated. Death is defeated. The King is alive. Y'all awake this morning. Put your hands together. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. We're here to give him glory today. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. Sing a little louder. Sing a little louder. Come on, church, sing it out. Sing a little louder. Praise the Lord, man. We're so excited today that you're here worshiping with us today at Liberty. Man, I tell you, I want to raise a hallelujah. God has been so good to our church, and what God's doing is amazing around here. We had a great week of kids camp this week. Last week, of course, we had our big announcement. Man, I just want to say that God's been good to us. God's working here, and we're just looking forward to what God's going to do 
in the future. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, God, we're so glad that we can gather together in your place. God, we're so ga- glad that we can gather and worship you. Lord, we're thankful for all that we've seen you do this week. God, all the things that you've brought to, pl- to happen here at Liberty. But God, we look forward to the future, God, of what you're going to do. God, I pray, Lord, you would speak to every heart today. Speak to every person in this place. God, for the ones that are watching online, God, that need you the most, Lord, I pray, God, that you would speak into their life right now, God. Help them, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much for being here. We're so glad to see all of you. And if this is your very first time being at Liberty, thank you so much for coming to Liberty. Now, some of you here, maybe you've been coming This is your second time or third time. I just want to encourage you and let you know, Liberty Church is just a group of regular, ordinary people that got problems. We're just trying to serve the Lord. And we just want to walk closer today than we were yesterday. We don't have it all figured out, but we want to just serve God and learn His Word and praise His name. And man, if you fit in that category, you'll be just fine right here at Liberty. If you've never filled out one of these connection cards, you can do us a great great favor Fill out whatever information you feel comfortable filling out that's in the chair right in front of you. I promise you, we're not going to sell your information. We're not going to spam you. I'm not coming to your house tomorrow and doing a house visit. We just kind of want to know your name, maybe how you heard about us, and if we can help you in any way, write that on the back of it. You can drop it at any of these connection boxes or communication boxes by the doors on the way out, or you can stop by our guest services, hand them the card. They'll hand you a gift. It's just our way of saying thank you for being here. We're just excited that you are here. Now, with kids camp being over, I just want to say very quickly to those watching online, all those that are in the room, if you helped in kids camp this week, I just want to say a huge thank you from the bottom of my heart. It was one of the greatest weeks we ever have, but it is the hardest week we ever have. If you work kids camp, you're still tired. I know you are, but I want to just say thank you so much for doing all that you did to make it happen. We've got a video we're going to show you, shows you just the highlights of it, but the sheer number of children, the work that goes into it, man, we could not do it without our volunteers, and so we're so thankful for you guys. Check this video out real quick. Welcome to Kids Camp Lego Mania. What do you like about Kids Camp? I love the Jango Chamber. Woo! What do you like about Kids Camp? Everything. All the Legos. It's great. Oh, yeah. Legos. <laughs> Legos. 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 Uh, the activities and the Bible verses. And we get to play soccer today. Hey guys, what are you guys excited about Kids Camp today?
big hand for what they did. Listen, unless you've been in 300 kids deep, 100 pizzas, 100 workers, I mean, you just don't know. It's crazy. And the way we say thank you is we end up sliming our workers because kids love to see people get slimed. Somebody asked me in the first service, preacher, why did they pie you in the face? I said, well, last Wednesday was my birthday. They called me up saying happy birthday to me and then pied me in the face. I mean, that's how they say they love you at kids camp. But I just want to just thank everybody from the bottom of my heart. Pastor Brad, our youth pastor, Zach Westall works, uh, uh, he's, a, he's his assistant up there. Man, Miss Robin and Dale, all the work that went in, all my volunteers. Guys, I don't want to forget any of you, but the truth is, if we all hadn't to put in all the time, all the work, all the effort, man, we would not have survived it. So thank you so much. I'm so glad that you guys care enough about the kids in our community to put on such an awesome, amazing event. Well, guys, let's do this. I'm excited. I get to preach the last sermon in this series today. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do for us uh, today in this service. So let's do this. Let's stand together, and we're going to sing and worship. I want you to be reminded this morning that we come into this place for a very specific reason. We come in here today to learn about, to sing about, and to praise the King of Heaven. And guys, I want you to just lift your hearts up, lift your voices up, and let's just worship Jesus for just a little bit today. I want you to help us with that. Guys, you lead us. The cross is my beginning. The line drawn in the
us out with us. It is done.
entire work ever existed is dead, nailed to that cross with Jesus. And he rose in victory so that one day I can see all the saints in glory with him. And we can spend all eternity praising his name where there's no more pain, no more suffering, and it's all because of what he did on that cross. So let's start right there. We're going to sing Roses in Blue. Roses in blue, pushed up from the earth. Rivers of tears flow from good times. Can you see it? Families are singing and dancing and laughing. Come on, church. This is our homecoming. Heaven joins in with the glorious sound. The great cloud of witnesses. Because the ones that were lost, they're finally home. The Father is a welcoming. Put your hands together in praise. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. church put your hands together this morning man it's so good to see you. i'm so glad that everybody comes in you know i'm always amazed every sunday some of y'all we should do this we should have a camera that y'all can see from the top here where y'all can see on the screen before the service starts if you were to look out here like when the countdown goes to zero it's like hey nobody's in the church and then when the first song's over the lights come up you're like oh hey there they all are right and so all you guys that come in late we love you and we appreciate you because it makes us feel good when we look out here and see you back and I'm glad you're at church today. Man, I am super excited about preaching the last sermon in the summer school series. We've been preaching about four things that every Christian must know in their life. And we've been preaching about those, and this will be the last one. And many of you know this, many of you don't, but I don't teach in the month of July. And so next week, Pastor Dusty will be starting a brand new sermon series called Serendipity. It's Finding God in unexpected places and he'll be teaching through the book of esther so it'll be a, a, a story a, a series on the book of esther you say why do you not teach in the month of july hey i gotta come up with stuff to preach the rest of the year y'all it's hard to do that when you, every week you're trying to come up with something so i spend july i use that time to plan all we're going to preach the rest of the year and so he'll be starting that next sunday so you know what that means I can preach anything I want right now, make y'all mad, I'll be at the beach next week. Somebody say amen, right? Isn't that great? And so I'll be able to just kind of cruise out and not have to worry about it. But you know one of the things I'm going to miss most about this sermon series, and my wife's the one that pointed out, she said, Matt, you are going to miss getting to preach with that ruler every Sunday. And I'm not lying, I kind of feel like a ninja when I'm preaching with this thing. I like it. I, I, I think I need to make this part of my service, man. I, I, I enjoy Somebody said, you get one of them pointers, you know, where you point at stuff, but no, but I do like it. Well, it's good to see you. We've been preaching through this summer school. Summer school is one of those things everybody hates, but it's that thing that you had to go to summer school to either make up time or make up credit so that one day you could graduate and get a job. And we've been preaching these four things. In week one, I said that every Christian must be able to answer this question, 
Are you going to heaven when you die? You know, that is the most important question every person will answer. Are you going to heaven? Now, if you can't answer this, come see me. I'll help you get to where you can say, absolutely, I'm going to heaven when I die. And then we preach the way we live matters. It's important for every Christian to understand and to realize that the way you live your life, it really matters. We said that it really matters because one day every person will stand before God and give an account of their life. Your actions here on this earth, they matter. And then last week I preached a sermon that I personally believe, not because I preached it, but because it's in Scripture, I believe every Christian, if you missed this sermon, needs to go back and watch it. Again, not because I preached it, but just because the biblical principles of how to deal with conflict in the church. And we know that people leave the church all the time over conflict. They don't leave because they don't love God anymore. They don't leave because they don't love Jesus anymore. They don't quit church because they all of a sudden had an epiphany that the Word of God is not true. Everybody who sits home on Sunday and just quits going to church, 99% of them quit because they had a conflict with somebody in the church and they didn't know how to handle it biblically. And so if you missed this sermon, I don't care if you missed all of it, go see this sermon, go listen to it, take notes, because one day, if it's not if, it's when, you're going to need this sermon on how to deal with conflict. Now today, I'm going to deal with a question that I hated when I was in school. How many of you will remember when you were in school and people would always come up and ask you, so what do you want to be when you grow up? You remember that? I hated that question. You say, Matt, why did you hate that question? Because I absolutely had no clue what I wanted to be when I grew up. I mean, I'm talking the fourth grade, we'd have kids pop up. I'm going to join the military. I get out of the military. I'm going to go to college four years. Get my four years. We're getting my master. I just want to hit that kid in the head because he had his whole life ahead of him planned out. And I'm like chilling, you know. I remember when I graduated. My graduation was over. Graduation over, you know, got the cap and the gown. So what's next for you, Matt? Well, I think we're going to eat lunch. I mean, that was as far as I had it planned out. I mean, I just didn't know. And honestly, for a long time in my life, I struggled with it. I had no clue. And honestly, I didn't even start pastoring until I was 34 years old. I mean, I am a late bloomer. That's what they call me. I mean, terrible in my life. And some of you in here, you probably still don't know what you want to do with your life. I get it. I get that. It's okay. But I want to say this to you today, that it's not okay in our spiritual life. You see, I'm here to tell you this morning that your spiritual life is not the same as your career. You have a specific, an absolute, a no questions asked direction for your Christian life. I'm going to put it in real simple terms. Every Christian has a mission, every one of you. I don't care what you do for a living. I don't care what your career is. There is a mission that you have. And before we get done preaching today, I hope you really get it and go, you know what, I may not have a clue what I'm going to do in my physical life, but spiritually, I know what I've got to do for Jesus Christ. I hope that's where every person here in this building and all of you watching online, I hope that's where you end up at the end of the sermon because there is a purpose for your life. You know, it, it is. Now, where's that purpose found? Well, take your Bible or take your iPad or your phone and look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. If you don't have any of those, we have it on the screen. And if you're like me and you need readers, this is a much easier version. We've got an old timer in the church that I used to work with. He come by me this morning. He come in. I said, hey, good morning. And all of a sudden, I see him headed back. I said, where are you going? He said, I forgot my readers. Old people problems. Old people problems. Right here, front row. You see, it happens. So we got it in big script up here so you can read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul's writing to the church at Corinth, and he's giving out some instruction, and he's telling them some things, and he develops in this little passage of Scripture the purpose and the mission of the Christian life, everyone's Christian life. And I'm going to have to get to that purpose, but I'm going to build some as we go. So let's read it, and then i got some preaching to do so we can get to the purpose. Notice what it says in verse 17. Therefore... If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. 
To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, I come to you today and God, I ask you that you would open our hearts to your word and that God, your word would speak to us. Lord, may every person in this room and every person watching online leave this place knowing and understanding that their life spiritually has a purpose and that their spiritual life has a mission. God, I pray that when we leave this place, that we would leave this place ready to accomplish this mission for you. Lord, we love you, Lord. Help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we get in and we talk about the mission and the purpose of your life and how in the world are you going to find what the mission and the purpose of your life is, Paul kind of starts it off by giving us a little precursor before he jumps into, this is what I want you to do. Basically, here's what he says. He says, because of this, you can do this. Everybody with me? Because of this statement I'm going to make, now you are equipped to be able to do the next thing. Now, notice the first thing he tells us. Notice what it says here. Jesus is the answer. You say, Preach, Preach, what do you mean? Well, notice what it says. He said, if a man's in Christ, he's what? A new creature. It says, if a man gets saved and a man becomes part of Jesus Christ, a woman gets saved or she becomes a part of Jesus Christ, the Bible says that we become a new creature and that everything old, what happens to it? It passes away and everything becomes new. Watch this, guys. When you get saved by the grace of God, take Matt, that God takes a guy like Matt and says, Matt, you got all kinds of problems, but I got good news. I'm the answer for all your problems. Everybody with me? Somebody say amen just so I know you're alive. All right, y'all look sad. Red Bull next Sunday. Everybody here. Everybody needs some. And because Jesus saved Matt, he said, Matt, I'm going to give you a brand new life, and you are going to walk different, talk different, look different, speak different, see the world different. Everything's going to be different because I'm going to save you and change you. Is that right? That's right. That's what happens. It's what Jesus does. Now, I want you to understand this, Christians. We must realize, every person here, that Jesus is the answer. Every person here has got to realize that. But you know what I'm afraid of? The church has forgotten that. The church has forgotten that Jesus really is the answer for the world that we live in. People come to me all the time. They go, preacher, can you believe how crazy the world is? Anybody watch news lately? Crazy. You don't believe the world's crazy? Just open up Twitter about 15 minutes. You'll be like, what in the world? The whole world has lost its mind, right? Man, if you don't believe that, just flip on over to Instagram or Facebook, and you see all that, and all we realize is the whole world's got problems. And you know what we all want to do, right? We all want to fix these problems. So here's what we do. How are we going to fix the problems? Here's what most people tell me. Well, preacher, when so-and-so becomes president, by gosh, all the problems will be fixed. And I'm like, well, that ain't happened in 200 years. What do you think is going to happen tomorrow? Man, we elect this one, and we got these problems. We elect this one, guess what we got? More problems, just a different kind. And I want to say this to you, church. There is no political party. There is no candidate. There is no movement or organization that can change America. The only thing that will change America is Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only thing that can change it. That's it. See, people say, you see the immorality in the world? I'm like, yeah, I see it. But am I shocked? No, I'm not shocked. I'm not shocked when people who don't know Jesus don't live for Jesus. I'm shocked when Christians don't live for Jesus. See, that's quiet right there. You see, what we find out, what we realize is Jesus is the answer. Jesus has always been the answer. People don't experience Jesus if they never experience the saving, changing power of Jesus Christ. I promise you, church, it ain't going to get better. I don't care who they are. It ain't going to happen. 
Jesus Christ is the difference. You see, Jesus Christ can come into someone's life who is an alcoholic or a drug addict and cannot just help them. He can change them. He can come into a sorry parent's life and make them a good parent. He can take a person in society who is not adding anything to it. He can save them and change them and, and make them into a person in society that everyone wants to be around. I'm just telling you right now, Jesus has the power to change people's lives today. And we've forgotten it somehow. We started going and saying, so-and-so's our help. Can I say something that won't offend y'all? It will offend you, but can I say it anyway? Some of y'all on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, arguing politics till I want to throat punch you. <laughs> and I ain't never seen somebody respond back to you and go, oh, yeah, you're right. Never seen that. I, I don't see it like, oh, man, I've been living wrong all this time, but, man, you posted that, and all of a sudden, man, I'm, I'm going to start doing this. It don't happen like that. I want to just say this to you, church. Why don't we spend the same amount of time posting about Jesus and the gospel of Jesus and let him take care of it and let him change what's going on in our country? Why don't we do that? It's because we forget that Jesus is the answer. If you're watching online right now and you were wondering, let me just finish it for you. Jesus is the the answer, he's always been the answer. Always. But number two, let me show you this quickly, because y'all about to die on me. Paul says, look, the reason you are who you are is because Jesus changed your life. And everything you used to do is dead, and now you live in a new life. And then he says, Matt, not only have I given you a new life, but notice what he says. All things are of God because God reconciled us to himself. And, and, then, and then what he says here in the last part of verse 18 is this, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. If you look down at the end of verse 19, it says, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Get this, guys. Everybody always asks me, preacher, I can't do anything for God. I don't have any talents, gifts. You know, I don't have any. I can't sing. I was talking to Drew, the drummer, this morning. We were joking. I said, man, you did a good job this morning, man. It's really awesome. And he was talking about something. I said, well, you know, I can't sing. I can't play. All I can do is go, yeah, that sounds good, right? But I get over here, and I get to singing, man. I just let it rip, even though I can't sing. But, but, I, I, like, but I ain't never getting up here, because I ain't got that, y'all, y'all, oh, yeah, y'all wouldn't want it. But let me say this to you. God's give us all, though different abilities you understand God's give us gifts God's give us talents but I want you to understand this God has all given us the same ministry and that ministry is the ministry of reconciliation now you say what in the world does that mean that's a weird ministry the ministry of reconciliation how much you to get this I want everybody to think about this how many of you realize that every child that's born in the world is born with something that separates them from God. Think about this. When Matt was born, I was born a little sinner. I, I know I was a sinner because mom didn't teach me to bite kids. It just come natural. <laughs> mom didn't say, now listen, when a kid gets your toy, you smack him in the head. She didn't have to say that, did she? It just come down. I'm like, give me my toy, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? If you've got kids here, I remember when Shelby was a little child, I, I couldn't hold her for like a year. If I did, I had to hold her with my back to me because if you let her head on you, she bit you. <laughs> like holding a piranha <laughs> all the time. She was a little mean sinner. That's what she was. And then they grow up to become lying little sinners. <laughs> did you get a cookie? Just chocolate chips all over her face. No, huh? -uh, not me. We don't have to teach them to do those things, right? Why? They're born that way. Here's the problem with that, though. When Matt was born, Matt was a liar. Matt was, a, Matt was mean. Matt was ugly. Matt was hateful. And here's the problem. I'm over here in my hatefulness, my ugliness, and God is sitting over there in his holiness. Perfect. And sin cannot be in his presence. And there was a problem between me and God. There was something blocking me from God. What was that problem? Sin. Well, here's the deal, church. Jesus Christ wants to reconcile me to God. He came and he died on the cross. He shed his blood for my sin. He paid the price. All I have to do is accept what he did, put my faith and trust in him. He'll remove my sin as far from me as the east is from the west. He'll remember it no more, and guess what? Man, I can just embrace God, right? Right? But how did I find out about that? 
somebody told me. I remember my daddy got saved. My dad was a drunk and drug addict. Y'all know the story? Dad was bad. He got saved. God helped him. He wouldn't have a car. We came to church. We went to church at Gospel Light Baptist Church. They had a bus ministry. He picked us up on the bus, church bus. Went to church bus school. You know, like there was like a it was a big gymnasium like this. We had bus church, is what they called it. Bunch of kids, three or four hundred of us, and there was a man named Rick Hildebrand. You know what Rick Hildebrand did? Every Sunday, he got him told me, Matt, God loves you. God died for your sin. God wants to take you to heaven one day. And guess what? Through Rick telling me, I came to Jesus Christ for salvation. You understand that me and you have been given this job, this ministry of reconciliation. And what is our job? We can't save anybody because we're just sinners like they are that are saved, right? But what we can do is we can tell people, hey, listen, man, I know a guy that can help you with your problems. Everybody with me? Every person here has been given that ministry. It starts in your house with your kids and it goes out your front door. Who should you tell about Jesus? Well, what if, you had the, what if you had the cure for cancer? Would you sit home in your house and go, man, I invented this cure for cancer. Isn't this awesome? Well, hey, I know somebody's got cancer. We're going to go help them. Oh, no, no, I'm going to keep it here. Would you do that? You would go tell everyone. You'd be on CNN and Fox News and on, on the Twitter, and you'd be on Instagram, and you'd be on Facebook, and you'd be everywhere that you could be, and you'd be going, hey, guys, listen, you ain't got to die of cancer. I got the cure. Wouldn't you be doing that? But how many people realize that everybody's got, got cancer who gets cured is still going to die one day? You realize that? I'm going to ask you some questions. I asked the first service this. It went over about as good as it's going over right now. <laughs> you know, you can tell when you have a dud of a sermon. You know, it's like you try it in a two-part. You're like, yep, both of them hated it. So you know it's not good, right? But I asked them some questions, and I want you to answer them by holding your hands up and down, okay? That's what I want you to do. And, and if you don't believe this, please, don't, don't raise your hand. I don't, I don't want you to lie. I just, I just want you to be honest, okay? And if you don't believe what I'm asking, that's okay, too. I'm not mad. I just ask some questions. But how many people in this room believe that there really is a heaven where people will live in eternity with God? Raise your hand. You believe that? Let's see here. Raise your hands. All right, you can put them down. And then I want you to answer this question. If there's a heaven, how many people believe that there's really a place of, tor of torment punishment called hell okay so you put your hands down so here's the question if we really believe if i really believe if man i'm gonna put it in my part because i know how sorry i am but if i really believe that there's a place where people can go and spend eternity in heaven in enjoyment and then i know that there's a place where people go that they would be tormented for eternity who would i not tell that news to if i really believe that Here's the question. I, I asked Pastor Barry in the first service. Of course, he lied. I said, Barry, how old are you? He said, I'm 25. I said, okay, we'll go with that. I said, church, if Barry here is 25 years old and Barry lives to be 85, I'm just giving him a long life. If he's got kids. He ain't going to live that long. <laughs> so say he lived to 85. He knows Christ. If Barry spent those 65 years telling everybody, telling people, hey, listen, you don't want to go to hell. There's a wonderful place called heaven. You don't have to go to hell. There's this great place called heaven. The way you get there is Jesus Christ wants to save you. He wants to change. He wants to do. If, if he spent his whole life doing that, how many people could he bring to Christ? What would be a, like success? Like how many people would have to go to heaven because of Barry telling them about it for Barry's life to be considered successful? Now, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, if, if, what if Barry... Five people went to heaven because Barry told them. Would that be successful? I, I don't know in 65. I don't know, would it? But, but let me ask you this, though. How many, and I don't want nobody to raise their hand in here, how many people could really, in your mind, could you really think that I know that this many people are going to heaven because I told them about it, and that's how they found Jesus? Don't raise your hand, but I just wonder, how many would that be in your life? You're 50 years old, you're 60 years old, you're 70 years old, and you say, this many people I know are going to heaven because I took the time to tell them. I listen, Rick Hildebrand. Salisbury, North Carolina, I know of one of them, and it's me. I know that. I don't know how many he's he, he shared it with over the years, but I know one day, one day I'll be able to go into heaven, I'll be able to walk up to Rick and hug you and say, hey, man, thanks for telling me about Jesus. I'll be able to do that. But, but how many of us can do that, and how many of them will that be? And what would that success rate, what would, that, what would we really consider successful if we spent our whole lives and, oh, you got a ton of money. Well, I died, I was a millionaire. Yeah, but how many of you went to heaven because of you? 
Or, or I died, and man, I had all this stuff. I had a beach house and a mountain house that my kids now have. and I, I, Just great. Oh, that's awesome. But how many people were in heaven because you just went and told them? That's the question. That, that's the thought I thought. And he said, every one of us has been given this ministry. See, it's not Matt's job to reconcile anybody to Jesus. I can't reconcile. I can't do it. All I can do is tell them about that guy that can do it. And my job is just to set up the meeting. Like, hey, Andrew, if you want to meet Jesus, I can help you meet him. All I can do is set that up. Jesus has to take over from there. But my job is to bring this, this message of reconciliation to everyone. And I know it's difficult, and I know it's hard, but listen, it's not some political candidate somewhere that's going to make a difference in your friend's life. But Jesus Christ can not only give your, your family member or your friend a better life here, he can give them an eternity in a place called heaven. And it should break our heart. And I know this is not how it works, because I know this is, I just know it's not. But what if we were in a line, and I was in line, I died, I'm waiting to go into heaven, and I'm in this line, and this is the line to heaven. And what if the line to hell was over here? And what if I'm walking up, and one of my friends are there, and he says, like, hey, man, which line are you? Oh, I'm going over here, I'm going to heaven. He's like, man, I'm, I'm going to hell. And he said, well, how did you get to heaven? He said, well, I, you know, I accepted Christ as my Savior, I put my faith and trust in him. I came to him in repentance. What if he looked at me and said, but Matt, why didn't you tell me? How would, you, how would we answer that? And could we really even say that they were our friend if we wouldn't tell them that? I mean, I don't, I don't think we could. And see, we've all been given this. He says that here's the deal. We're actually just given the word of reconciliation. That means all we have to do is open our mouth and say, hey, man, would you be reconciled to Christ? God loves you. He wants to save you. You know, it's, it's, really, it's really tough, isn't it, to think about it that way. I got a lot I wanted to preach, and in my mind, it worked a lot better than it is right now, right? Like, I thought, I'm going to bust this part and this part and this part, and bam, you know, and then I'm like, okay, I'll never get all that said. But I do want to say this, this your commission, Paul says this, now then, Matt, you're an ambassador for Christ. I mean, what, you never go to a foreign country, you go to a foreign country, there's that place there that represents your country. What's the name of that? Embassy. Embassy. So an embassy is a place, like if you go to, say, Russia, there's a, 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 an American embassy there. And so if an American citizen has problems, he can go to that, that place, right? And in that embassy works a guy that they call an ambassador. How many of you realize this? I know you don't realize, I know you, this would never happen, but it could happen. You know, President Biden could call me right now and say, Matt, I want to meet with you. I could walk into his office. He said, Matt, I want you to be an ambassador for me. And he could send me literally anywhere in the world. He could say, I want you to go to Ethiopia. I want you to go to Russia. I want you to go to Yugoslavia. I want you to be my ambassador there. What would that mean? I want you to go there and do my business on my behalf. Everybody with me? He could do that. And, it, and Matt not, is nobody special, but just because the president said, hey, take this commission, I want you to do this, I would be in speaking in on the behalf of the president of the United States. I would represent him and his country there. And Paul says this, Matt, you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You, you know what I think we've forgotten, church? And I'm just going to say this, and this is the part that it didn't work out real good because I got scripture I was going to read, and y'all were going to see it go, whoo, look at that, but I don't have time. But I want you to understand that if I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ, what that means is, is although I live in the United States of America, this is not my country. See, the book of Hebrews says this, Matt, you are a stranger and a sojourner in a foreign land. And that one day, I'll call you back home and you'll live with me in our country forever. And where you're at right now, Matt, even though you live there, you're a stranger there. I know you got the same accent as them, and I know you dress like them, and I know you talk like them. But know this, Matt, you belong here with me in our country, on this side of the world. That's who you belong. Everybody with me? You see, we have a different country. And the book, of, and the book of, of Hebrews says that people were desiring to be in that foreign country. And one of the things I think most Christians have forgotten today is that you're not going to live here forever, church. This is only going to be 60, 70, 80, 90 years of your eternal life. 80 years here, a billion years there. That's your country. And not only, not only do we have a different country, understand this today, church, we have a different king. 
You know, the Bible says this, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. And what does that Lord mean? It means Lord like a king. He is over everything. And the Bible says one day he'll come back as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And although Biden is my president, Jesus Christ, he is my king and he's who I represent on this earth. He's my king. But just like ambassadors have missions that the president sends them out to accomplish, church, understand this, we have a mission. God didn't save every one of you in this room and everybody watching online so you could sit somewhere and do nothing. He saved you and said, listen, I got a job for you to do. What's that job, man? I want you to go tell everybody about me. The Bible says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Bible says, teaching them and baptizing them in my name and, and, and teach them everything that I commanded you. How many of you realize that that's the mission of every person in this room? But you know, most of us live our lives as if nothing spiritual matters. What if God's people really realize one day we're ambassadors for Jesus Christ? We have a mission, and that mission is to reach every person we can with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you think it would change the world we live in? absolutely everyone in this room. If everyone in you in this room really got a burden to say, you know what, I'm going to tell somebody, one of my friends, about Jesus. You change your community. Change your world. You say, how do you know that? Well, I know that because when Jesus left and went back to heaven, there was 12 disciples. And now we're the largest denomination, largest faith in the world. 12 guys said, let's get this done. I'm going to go tell somebody. Church, I want to say this to you, and I want you to get this today. Your mission is greater than what you do for a living. It's greater than how you take care of and physically uh, uh, um, afford the lifestyle you have. Man, every day when you get up, it's a brand new opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. So, so what do we take it? How do we take this home? Let me give it to you quick. I told you, man, this message did not work out the way I timed it. First thing every Christian needs to start realizing is that Jesus is still the answer. I don't know where in the world the church bought into the government and somebody else is going to come in and take care of us and everything's going to be fine. I don't know where we all got that from, but understand this day, Jesus' answer today has always been the answer. We've got to realize that. Number two, understand this, it's time for us to tell everybody about Jesus. You, you get this, guys. Understand this. Every person needs to hear about Jesus. And I know what you're thinking. You're sitting in here going, preacher, everybody knows about Jesus. Don't you buy that lie. We had kids come to this kids' camp, over 300 of them every night. You'd be shocked how many of them have never been to church or don't go to church, or that was as close to church as they'll ever get. Why? Because not everybody was raised the way you were. And they need to hear about Jesus Christ. And by the way, man, everything we're talking about, colleges, news outlets, and social media is telling them is a lie. Everything we're saying is a lie. There is no God. There is no judgment. There is no, you're not going to face God one day. They're backing up what they already believe. And it's our job to bring this message to people. And then this third thing so important, church. You've got to remember who you represent. You see, when you realize who you represent, it makes you act different, don't it? You ain't going to go to some foreign country representing the President of the United States and get arrested for shoplifting. It ain't going to happen. You ain't going to get over and get some kind of party brawl going on. And it, no. You ain't going to do that. Why? Because you represent the President of the United States. Listen, guys. We represent God. We represent Jesus Christ, the Lord and King of Kings. It should change the way we act. It should change the way we live. It should change the way we talk. It should change the way we represent Him. Church, I guess what I'm trying to say is this. Your mission is to reach somebody, and if I have to just be plain, who are you reaching? Who is it? Who is that person? Well, if you say, well, preacher, I don't have one, well, it's time to get one. Somebody that you're reaching with the gospel. Father, we come to you today, and we're so thankful that, God, we have this opportunity to gather here. We're thankful, God, that you've given us the information to know you and to love you and to live in your presence god we pray lord that you would help us to tell others about you help us to realize that our life is a mission and that our job is to reach others for you god we love you and we pray god you'd put a burden on every one of our hearts to tell somebody about jesus christ 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. That's good preaching. Put your hands together for him this morning. What a great challenge to reach the world for Jesus. I want to thank you so much for being here. We've had an amazing time worshiping and hearing the word with you this morning. There are a lot of places around here that you could go, but you chose to be with us, and we really appreciate it. Would you stand with us this morning? Put your hands together one more time for Kids Camp and the volunteers. And that was only possible thanks to your generosity. You know, we don't give out an offering plate here, but you can text to give, you can give online, and you can give in the giving boxes. And as you can see, 402 different children walk through these doors, and that's a reach in our community because of your tithes and your offerings. Uh, let's have a word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Dear Lord, thank you so much for our commission, our mission here on earth, to reach others for you. And I pray we wouldn't take that lightly, and we go out and reach our coworkers, our family, and our friends, so that when we get to heaven, we know that we spread the gospel to everyone that we met. Thank you so much for what you're doing here at Liberty Church and what you're doing in all our lives. We thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.